Church, I, I just have no words to express my gratitude for, for that. And just uh, for the last 15 years and the last 31 years that we've been around here. But I, I just uh, want to thank you. And I want you to know this, too. I want you to know that um, really at the end of the day, it is important to us that you realize that it is all because of Jesus that Jen and I are able to do this. And he is the one that gets all the glory every weekend and every day at City First. It is him that changes lives. And, and uh, you need to know, too, that Jen and I consider this an honor. This is not something that we look at as a job. This is not our career. This is our passion. This is our call. And it is our honor to be your pastor. So thank you for making City First Church your home. And thank you, even if you're here for the first time, I want you to know this. If you're, you know, you may have been here for 15 years or 15 minutes. Um, man, I tell you, I hope that you make this place your home. Because as a church family, we really do try to love each other and love our world as we love Jesus. And so um, just let's give Jesus a round of applause for the last 15 years because he's the one that deserves it. He really does. But thank you. You know, if it's okay, um, I, I would like to, before I start my message, I'd like to take a moment and say a brief but important word of prayer for our nation. The last couple weeks have been very difficult, uh, as there have been three tragic incidents that have taken place in the states of New York, California, and most recently, Texas. And obviously, the, the whole nation is paying attention to this. The whole nation um, is mourning this and grieving, or at least should be grieving. And I just thought, you know, what are we to do as the church? What are we to do? Well, that could be a whole sermon and probably multiple sermons, but very simply, I think the first thing we could do is pray, especially for those families that were impacted by these events. And I want us to remember something. So many times in church, so many times as Christ followers, we know that God is everywhere. In fact, the word for that is omnipresent, that he is an omnipresent God, which means that he is all places at once. And, and we know that. But many times we forget that also evil is at all places at once. Now, I didn't say the devil. The devil is not omnipresent. He can't be at all places at once. But guess what? His work is at all places at once in this hopelessly broken world. And I think what we saw this uh, last two weeks is we saw evil. We saw a real evil, an evil inside of human hearts that, in a sense, made them do certain things and see the world in certain ways. And, and you know, what? there are things that we are to do as people, and I know that right now there's conversations about that, and that's a whole other topic. There are things that we must do as people, but this is what I know. There's only one person that can change the human heart, and that is Jesus. There's only one. And that... You know what, we really need as a nation to pray because at the end of the day, this is a heart issue. It's an evil issue. It's a God versus evil. It is a human heart issue. And I want us to take a moment and pray and also pray for the families. So if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads and closing your eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for our nation. Lord, we've been... Um, in the last two weeks, face to face with some of the realities of, of evil and sin, whether it be the sin of racism, the sin of hate, the evil that has taken place that has impacted innocent lives. And Lord, I just pray right now for our nation, the heart of our nation, that seems so divided. It seems that we are at odds with each other that there is so much hate in our culture right now, so much anger, so much pain, so much hurt. God, we ask that you would move in our nation. And that, Lord, I think we're seeing what even what was mentioned in the Wall Street Journal this week, that could it be the absence of the church and spirituality that has led us to these places. I don't know. But God, at the end of the day, this is what I know. 
We need you. We need you in America. We need you around the world. We need Jesus to change hearts, our hearts. And Lord, I pray specifically for the families of those that were impacted, those that lost loved ones, those that lost children, moms and dads, brothers and sisters. God, we don't know why everything happens and we don't know exactly what to do, but we do ask this, that your peace and your love and your strength and your presence would be there. Lord, we uh, pray that, Lord, your love would surround these uh, families that are hurting beyond any words that we could describe. God, be close. I pray that there would be people surrounding these families, surrounding these individuals, that they would sense our prayers and our strength through them. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we just say we need you. We need you to be close. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen, amen. You know, um, I believe moments like that are important. I don't think that's just rote and ritual. I don't th think that's just something that we do. It's not cliche. I do believe that prayer really does move the hand of God. And at the end of the day, we as a nation, we as a world, we need, we need Jesus. We really do to help our hearts and our heart as a collective nation. Well, today I want to talk actually um, on the you know, 15th anniversary celebration. I actually want to talk about about a, a church that prevails in times of fear. That's what I want to talk about, the church that prevails in times of fear. Now, when I'm talking about the church, I'm also speaking not of us just collectively together, capital C Church, but I'm also talking about you as an individual. So today, when I say the word church, I want you to think you, and I want you to think us at the same time. Because that's really how the Bible describes the church. The church is not brick and mortar. It is not the building, the roof, and the walls. But the church is actually a movement of people. In fact, in the first century, people that were not a part of Christianity or did not claim to be Jesus followers didn't know how to describe these gatherings, and so they named them ecclesia. It was a word that meant movement because it wasn't about a building. It was about a gathering that was a movement of people, but it was a movement made up of individuals. So when I say church today, I want you to know that I'm not speaking about just us as a big building or us as buildings or wherever, city first, wherever you're at, but rather I'm talking about us as individuals too, because guess what? You're a temple of God and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you if you're a Christ follower, which means you are the church. Do you know you're the church to your neighborhood? You're the church to your workplace. You're the church to your school. It, it, this is the building we gather in, but you're the church. And so we want to talk about what we should do in times of fear and how we are to be a prevailing church. In other words, an overcoming church. One of the traits that has marked the last two years of our world is the trait of fear. There's been a lot of fear. Jen and I were just flying home on Sunday, or excuse me, on uh, Friday night, and uh, the lady in front of us started to have a coughing fit. And I'll tell you, the worst place in the world to have a coughing fit nowadays is on an airplane. Now, before COVID, we would all went, oh, no, you know, or whatever. Now, after COVID or in these COVIDian moments, now somebody coughs on a plane and everybody thinks we're all going to die. We're all going to die, literally, right? Fear, fear, fear. So on this weekend that you have graciously celebrated, Jen and I as the senior leaders of this church, I want to talk about what I believe God wants to do through our church and through us as individuals in these unique times of fear. And I would say this, it's unique to us, but it's not unique to the church, the, the church of 2,000 years. There have been plenty of times in the last two millennia that they, the church has encountered times of fear. But this probably for us, this moment is real. These two last years have been real. These last two weeks have been real. So what are we to do and how are we to prevail? I believe this. I believe that the best way that God is going to get his will done, or in other words, his work done in this world, is through individuals like you and me 
planted, growing, and living in unity in the local church. I believe that with all my heart. And Jesus said that he's going to launch and that he would lead a prevailing church. And I want to take you to the very famous story that is found in Matthew chapter 16, where he talks about this. Many of you have grown up in church, or some of you that are new to church even have heard this story before, but many of us probably haven't. It says this, now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, he's talking in third person here, right? Son of Man meaning himself. So what he's really saying is, who do people say I am? And they answered him, the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So in other words, he starts with the greater group. He goes, who do they say I am? And then he looks at his disciples. He says, okay, how about you? How about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven and I tell you, you are Peter. So now he's talking to Peter. And he says, and on this rock, meaning on you, Peter, I will build my church. And then he says this famous saying that is now famous. He goes on to say, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Caesarea Philippi is located in what we now call northern Israel. If you've ever been to Israel before, north of the Sea of Galilee, is Caesarea Philippi. It was a Roman area. The Romans had named the area, thus Caesarea after Caesar, Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus and his disciples had walked many days to get there. And now all of a sudden they're having this conversation and Jesus is saying, who do you say that I am? Peter answers, you are Christ, the son of God. In other words, you're the Messiah. You are not just a good prophet. You are literally the son of God. And, and Jesus says, you're right. Caesarea Philippi was a region where they, people in that region that did not know Jesus, they worshipped a Greek god named Pan, P-A-N. You've seen him before. Here's a picture of him. He is half goat and he is half man, the, the people believed, and he played a flute and he was the god of nature and the wild. He was the god of the woods and harvest. And if he was happy, you'd have a good harvest. If he was mad, there might be a drought or something like that. Now, the people believe that Pan was an ugly god. He was not like the other Greek gods that had a Greek god-like body like many of us in the room, all right? He was not like that. But rather, he, I'm saying that in faith, uh, rather, he was an ugly god, and, and whenever he tried to flirt with the female nymphs, now the nymphs were these imaginary fairy tale creatures that the people believed lived in the woods also, they believed Pan would flirt with them. And so on Friday night, he would go and try to hook up with some nymphs, and, uh, and they would reject him because he was, he was ugly. And so he became mad, they believed. And instead of just roaming the woods, instead what he would do is he would hide in the woods and he would scare the nymphs. And so he would, in, in a sense, create fear in these imaginary figures. This is where we get the word panic. You ever wonder where we get the word panic? Panic comes from this story that the Greeks believed. And so in Caesarea Philippi, they believed that uh, that. Pan lived in this grotto or this cave. Here's a picture of it. Um, it was a naturally made cave, and the people of the day believed this is where Pan lived. In fact, this is where once a year they would have a human sacrifice. They would throw the virgin, um, a, a dead body of the virgin, into the cave, and they believed that this would pacify pan. They also believed that this cave was a portal to the underworld. And so if you were to go into this cave, it would actually descend into hell. The nickname for this cave during Jesus' day was this. It was called the Gates of Hell. Some of you are already connecting the dots. Here's Jesus in Caesarea Philippi where they worship a god by the name of Pan, the god that solicits fear, who lives in a cave called the Gates of Hell. 
And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, you know what? I'm going to build my church on you. You're going to launch it, Peter. You aren't going to run it forever. You're going to launch it. And the church is going to become something that is a movement. And the church is going to spread the good news of Jesus. And by the way, the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, I believe this. This isn't in the Bible. I believe Jesus might have been literally standing outside of this cave. And he's looking at his disciples and he says, the church is going to thrive. And guess what? And he might have even pointed at the cave. And the gates of hell will not prevail. What was he saying? He was saying the church is going to be unstoppable. The church is going to prevail. And the enemy is going to try to use fear. But the church is not going to be overcome by fear. But rather it's going to live by faith. The gates of hell will not prevail. Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that you are a part of an unstoppable movement whose head is Jesus Christ and whose mission is constantly advancing regardless of the enemy's efforts to make us afraid? Do you understand this? You are on the winning team and you will forever be on the winning team. I hear a lot of people talking about church nowadays, like, oh, church, it's failing. No, listen to me, listen to me. The church is advancing. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But you got to remember, as I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about the organization of the church. I'm not talking about us collectively. I'm talking about you. Do you realize that the Spirit of God lives inside of you and the gates of hell will not prevail against you? That you will overcome fear with faith. It's kind of interesting. Uh, here's a saying. Um, healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. That means healthy churches grow. That means healthy Christ followers grow. In fact, you should be growing as a Christ follower. I should be growing as a Christ follower. Now, every day you don't see it, right? I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying we make mistakes. Yes, we do. We make wrong decisions. Sometimes we sin. We got to go back and say, God, forgive me. Okay, my point is, is this. If you were to compare your life to one year from now, hopefully, that you will see growth. Hopefully you'll see difference. If you compare your life to one year ago, hopefully you see different. So here are some characteristics of a prevailing church or a prevailing Christ follower. First one is this, devoted. Prevailing churches are devoted. Acts chapter 2. Here is the launch of the church, okay? Jesus predicted it in Matthew 16, but then in Acts chapter 2, Jesus is ascended to heaven. There's the day of Pentecost, Peter, remember Peter was going to be the one that started the church? He comes outside of the upper room and he starts preaching and 3,000 people that day give their lives to Jesus in one day. Literally in one day, the church from, went from 120 people to 3,120 people, literally, in one day. It became a mega church overnight. And here Peter is preaching, and then it goes on to say later on in chapter 2, it says all the believers, meaning the 3,000 plus people that were following Jesus now, all the believers devoted, turn to the person next to you and say devoted, all right? Devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, in other words, communion, and to prayer. Can I tell you, everything we do at City First is wrapped up in this verse. This is why we exist as a church, all right? That basically we come together and we come together for teaching. That's what you're doing right now. You're listening to teaching, right? That you devote yourself to fellowship. That means gathering together as the family of God. We come together as a church. This isn't like joining the Elks Club or a country club or whatever else, okay? This is different. We come together as a family and we gather. We share meals, Man, that sounds a lot like a life group, right? It's the big group that all of a sudden then breaks off and becomes small through the week and shares meals, shares communion together. And a prayer, that's like personal devotion time. All those things we find here in this church. And really what this verse is talking about is talking about the culture of the church. Do you know a church has a culture? Your business has a culture. Your family has a culture. It doesn't matter at your business what's written on the wall as a mission statement. That doesn't matter. What really matters is the culture in the hallways, right? Sometimes cultures are toxic. 
Sometimes they're healthy, right? Well, every church should have a culture that was just mentioned in Acts chapter 2 there. They were devoted. It was a culture of self pursuit after God. This is so important, and I really want you to hear this today, all right? Because really, at the end of the day, we are all responsible for stirring up a passion for God. It is no one else's responsibility. We are responsibility-taking people that we are the ones that own our relationship with God. It's not dependent on our spouse, our kids, our parents, the pastor, the youth pastor, somebody else. Rather, we must take responsibility and stir up a passion for God. I'll say this, I mean, 15 years is a long time. The average senior pastor lasts at a church just under four years in America. And I know 15 years is a long time. I'm not saying that to, to, to you know, blow my own horn here. I'm saying that to say this. At the end of the day, I can't be the one that stirs up a passion in you. I can't be the one. I don't, I, it takes everything inside of me to stir up a passion for my own relationship with Jesus. And yes, every weekend, every week we come together, I'm a good reminder, but at the end of the day, I hope that you are the one that Monday through Saturday, you stir up that passion, you stir up that relationship with God. You are the one that are a self-starter. Because many churches have this idea that the culture says, oh, it's the people on the stage's responsibility to stir my passion. No, no, no. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't have the talent or ability to do that. There's no way. I can only come here and do what I do, but at the end of the day, we all leave here and we are all responsible to stir up our own passion. A prevailing church is full of devoted people who self-stir a hunger for more of God. They're stirring themselves up in prayer, stirring themselves up in generosity and giving, stirring themselves up in growth and in the word of God. And so they're devoted to the apostles' teaching. They're devoted to gathering together. They're devoted to putting into practice the teachings that they hear. That was the first century church. That was the first century church. So, you know, one of the things that I know in America you're seeing right now is you're seeing the statistics that Christianity as a worldview is on the, uh, on the decline. And... Uh, and, you know, you might be looking and, and saying, yeah, but the average size of churches is shrinking in America. And that is all true. That data is actually all true. In fact, the average size church in America right now is 67 people. 67 people is the average. That is down approximately 20 people on average from pre-COVID two years ago. All right? And so I will tell you, we are trending in the wrong direction in America. But here's, here's the problem. We Americans think, since it's happening in America, it must be happening around the world because we as Americans kind of think we're the center of the universe sometimes, you know. But that's really not true. Actually, Christianity is exploding around the world. In South America, it is growing like crazy, like wildfire. In Africa, in Asia, even in the Middle East. You know that one of the biggest revivals right now happening in the world is in the Middle East. I'm telling you, it is growing. The church of Jesus is growing all around the world. And I know some of you are like, oh, man, I wish we had that in America. And I would agree with you on that. I would agree, and it is possible. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We have framed, I think, church wrong in America. Because as Americans, we many times are leading the world in uh, productivity and, and creating and manufacturing and all of these things like that. So many times, we look at church as just something that we attend. But in these other places where it's growing, they don't look at it as a place to attend. They look at it as a, a movement. They are a part of a family. They are a part of God's move in that world. And here's what I mean by that. A lot of times people will leave American churches and they'll say, well, that was a good service. Or maybe that wasn't a great sermon. Or I don't know if I like the worship that much. They didn't sing my favorite songs. Or, you know, whatever. You fill in the blank. But what that really speaks to is it speaks to, I think, a core issue that we have as Americans that we need to overcome if we're going to see revival. And that is this. Those comments speak to consumerism. It speaks to consumerism. 
that, that, that we shop around for the church that we like the best. And, and here's the thing. In the Middle East right now, there are reports where, you know, you're persecuted if you're a Christian in these Muslim countries. Like, you might be put to death, very much probably imprisoned. And there are stories that people are going up to people and whispering the name of Jesus, literally just going, Jesus, whispering the name of Jesus, and people are instantly being healed of issues, or they are getting saved on the spot just with the name of Jesus. Why? Because it's not about, well, I don't know if I like that worship or not. Listen, if you're in the persecuted church, you don't care if the song that was sung was your favorite song or not. You just want to worship Jesus. You need a rescue. You need protection. You need his presence. So let, listen, listen, I'm telling you, we as Americans, we need to get back to that self-stirred passion for Jesus. A prevailing church is one that's devoted, and devotion must be a personal choice. It's not something that comes from a stage or from a sermon. It comes from every day going, I choose to be devoted to listen to the teachings, to gathering together, to spreading the good news. I choose it. Second thing is this, is that a prevailing church is expectant. Expectant. Last night, there were 50,000 plus people that were at Soldier Field for a Coldplay concert, all right? And I like Coldplay. But guess what? They paid a lot of money for those tickets, and they were expectant. They didn't walk in going, well, this is probably going to be boring or whatever. They might have even showed up early because they didn't want to miss the opening song, right? And here's the thing. If we as a church would have that kind of attitude of we're going to come to church every single week and we're going to come expectant. Okay, listen, it's my 15 year. I can shoot straight today and be a little passionate about these things, all right? But so many times we don't. And even today, here's, here's, here's an honesty moment. I, I got here at 7 a.m., I'd gone through the drive through at Starbucks, got my grande uh, hot Americano, and uh, I walked into church and literally had a, a moment. I literally spilled it literally all down the front of me. I haven't done this in 15 years. Like, I, I, there's never been a Sunday that I spilled the coffee on me, and I'm like, wardrobe change, you know? I am frantically calling home. Anybody at the house, bring me some. This is my second outfit today. This is not what I planned on preaching in. Um, so I didn't come today to, ch to church expecting. I'll be honest with you. I came a little frantic. All right? I'm like, give me, give me a new shirt. You know, ah. And, and many of us did the same thing. I mean, you're just happy to be here, right? I mean, you might even got an argument with your spouse on the way. Your kids were driving you crazy in the minivan on the way here. I mean, they're, they're, okay, that's real. But now that we're here, now that the kids are over there and they're having a great time in, in, in our kids' ministry, and trust me, they're learning about Jesus. It's going to be amazing, Okay? But now that you're here and you're in this space or right now in your living room or wherever you're gathered, are you expectant? Now you got past the crazy, are you expectant? This is not just another appointment. It's not just another meeting. This isn't like you're just, you know, ticking the box here. It's not just another, you know, slot in your day timer or your iCal. This is a moment to encounter the living God. And I'm going to state something here that maybe sounds a little sensational, but I believe it with all my heart. Today, Jesus is in this place. He's with you right now, wherever you're watching. He is here. And when we worship, this isn't like when we worship, we're just singing some songs dutifully before the message. No, this is a time that we're lifting up the King of Kings and the Lord of lords, the one who conquered death, hell, and the grave, the one who is our risen Savior, the one that literally spoke the world into existence, that is all-powerful, almighty, the God of the supernatural. Do you know he's here right now? He is in this place. And you might say, I don't feel him. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter what we feel. The Bible says wherever two or three are gathered together, Jesus is there. One two, three. Okay, we qualify. There's more than two or three. He's here in this place. And during COVID, I believe the American church lost its excitement about being together. And can we stir that up again? 
and come with an expectancy. Like walking in the doors, and I hope this doesn't sound cheesy, but we walk in the doors of wherever auditorium or place that we are gathering, if it's life group or wherever, and we walk in the doors and we say, I wonder what God is going to do today. I wonder what he's going to speak to me today. I wonder who he's going to heal today. I wonder who he's going to deliver today. I wonder what he is going to do today. Can we walk into that? And I know it takes a discipline. It goes back to point one. We got to just stir ourselves and be devoted. But unfortunately, the, us in America, I think of many times, many times we painted Jesus to be boring, and it's all liturgical, and it's all like high church, and we walk in, and everybody is like a stiff plywood board, and you know, we do these things and all that, but no, listen, you know what? Jesus is dynamic. I love, um, I've, I've, I've quoted Dorothy Sayers multiple times in the last 15 years, and she was an author, uh, has now gone to heaven, but she wrote this, and I thought this was good. She said, to do them justice, the people who crucified Jesus did not do so because he was a bore. Do you hear that? Quite the contrary. He was too dynamic to be safe. Jesus is not safe. Jesus will rattle your cage. Jesus will turn everything upside down. She goes on to say, it has been left for later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have declawed the Lion of Judah and made him a house cat for pale priests and pious old ladies. Oh, listen, Jesus was a revolutionary. He didn't get crucified because he was politically correct and safe. He didn't get crucified because he made everybody feel good. He got crucified because he had a dynamic personality that came and challenged the religious system of the day. And he went and walked amongst the lepers who were the outcasts of life. And he healed people and he claimed to be the son of God. And he was a revolutionary of the soul. They wanted a revolutionary that would overturn the Roman government. And he said, no, I'm going to overturn sin and the curse of sin on our lives. Did you come today needing a touch from God? Do you need the empowerment of his spirit? Do you need wisdom that's supernatural? Do you need help in how to run your family, your business, to train up your kids? Do you need help? Do you need unconditional love? Do you need forgiveness? All of these things are found dynamically in the person of Jesus, abundantly in the person of Jesus. And when we walk into the almighty presence of God, things shift and change and become new inside of us. I still believe in a God that's supernatural. I believe in a God that can do the impossible. I believe in a God that can save someone who is so far away from faith that we've given up on them, but God has not. Come expectant. Third thing about the prevailing church is that it's constantly changing. And I don't mean changing necessarily in methodology, although that's true, but it's changing on the inside. And again, remember when I'm talking about church, I'm talking about you. A prevailing church is one that constantly becomes more and more and more and more like Jesus. There's a weird mindset that actually is false. It's false theology in our current culture, and that is this. We believe that we should attend a church that already supports our current lifestyle and belief systems. Like, like that's pretty arrogant if you think about it. It's basically saying, I'll only worship a God I agree with. So what do we do? We customize Jesus to fit our existing lifestyle, our existing mindset, our existing actions and beliefs. But that wasn't the real Jesus. In fact, that isn't what a prevailing church does. A real mark of a prevailing church is that we don't become more of who we think we already are, but rather we become more of who God says we should be, which means the old you dies and a new you is born in Jesus. It means that the old habits and beliefs and lifestyles and choices, they begin to go away over time, and we embrace 
a Jesus kind of life, a life where Jesus literally is the center and he becomes our character and our motivation and our worldview. And to do that, it takes time. And to be honest with you, it takes years and it takes decades. It doesn't happen overnight, but we want to become more like Jesus. We want to become more like him. So when I come to church, I come to church going, God, how do you want me to change today? Not how are you going to change to fit my box? How do you want me to change? And as we do that, we become more like him and we experience true freedom and true holiness. This last week I was um, at a doctoral advance and I was with my cohort that I'm in this doctoral uh, process with and we were talking about who we were when we were young. I'm very grateful for City First Church. Back in the day, it was called First Assembly of God, and here's the reason why. Because I came here before I believed. I came here before I behaved. I, I came here, and I was, I was an all-out punk. I mean, I was a jerk. I really was. I was a young adult who just was full of pride and did really bad things that I'm not proud of. And we were with this uh, cohort, and we were kind of talking about our lives B.C., before Christ. And I was talking about mine, and my friend Scott, who runs a big church down in Houston, a dynamic church, he said, Jer, he goes, I can't see that. He goes, I can't believe the stories you're telling me, that that was you back in the day. And I said this to him, I go, oh, Scott, it proves there is a God. Because I didn't change because of self-help. I didn't change because I willed it into existence. I didn't change because I just learned better habits. I changed because of the power of Jesus. I changed because of the power of the cross. I changed because an old life went away and a new life came. And oh, I am far from perfect. And you are far from perfect. But listen, we're changing every single day. Last thing is this, is the trademark or characteristic of a prevailing church, and I pray this for City First, is that we are a rescuing church. A rescuing church. As a local church, we are called to be the rescue. Here's a sign, that a picture of a sign that was up in 1970 at the corner here of Spring Creek and Mulford Roads where we now sit. And the old auditorium that is not this auditorium is actually the one that is to my right. It seats about a thousand people, hadn't even been built yet. And there was a pastor by the name of Eugene Whitcomb who put this sign up, future home of First Assembly of God. And what does it say? Christ is the answer. And I thought to myself, that's really what the message of us as a church should be, whether individual or corporately. Wherever we go, into our workplaces, into our schools, into our neighborhoods, Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer. It's why I prayed that prayer at the very beginning for our nation. At the end of the day, yes, there's action we must take. But at the end of the day, Christ is the answer to solve the problem of sin in the human heart. And so Jesus has given us new lives. And what God does in our life becomes a catalyst and it spills over into our workplaces and our neighborhoods. And pretty soon, those people experience freedom when they are introduced to Jesus. 23 years ago, I was in this room. I was a youth pastor. And uh, I was praying. The room looked very different. You saw a little picture of it in that video. It was like pink pews, burgundy carpet. And uh, I was in here praying and I had my disc man. Anybody know what a disc man is? Like CDs back in the day, before the iPod, before the iPhone. Um, it wasn't digital music, it was on CD. And I had a disc man. It was like the size of a small laptop that you would put on your belt. You put it in there, it had little puffy ear, you know, phones and headphones. And, and I was in here praying and listening to music. And there was a song by Al Denson I was listening to. It was 1999. And this song talked about, will you be the one? I want to read you the lyrics as we close. Because I pray that today that you would choose to be the one who's devoted. You would choose to be the one that comes expectant. That you would choose to be the one that allows Jesus to change you. And you would choose to be the one that is the rescue to your world that you live in. The song goes like this, in a world full of broken dreams... Where truth is hard to find. Not a lot has changed in the last 23 years, huh? For every promise that is kept, there are many left behind. Though it seems that no one cares, or nobody cares, it still matters what you do. 
Because there's a difference you can make, but the choice is up to you. Will you be the one to answer to his call? Will you stand when those around you fall? Will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world? Tell me, will you be the one? Oh, sometimes it's hard to know who is right and what is wrong and where you are supposed to stand when the battle lines are drawn. There's a voice that's calling out for someone who's not afraid. We do not give in to the gates of hell, pan, panic, fear, but rather we prevail, right? To be a beacon in the night to a world that's lost its way. There's still some battles that I must fight from day to day, yet the Lord provides the power for me to stand and say, now it becomes a personal moment, I will be the one, I will be the one to answer to his call. I will stand when those around me fall. I will be the one to take his light into a darkened world. I will be the one. That's what I'm asking you to commit to today. If there's any gift that you could give me for 15 years, I appreciate so much the gifts and the cards and the emails. But can I tell you what this pastor heart wants you to be? You would choose to be the one, to be devoted, to come expectant. That you would choose to be the one that says, Jesus, change me. And you would choose to be the one to be the rescue. So let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Today you say, maybe it's your first time or maybe you've been coming here. You say, I, I haven't made Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life. And I need to do that today. I want to be the one that stands up and says, Jesus is my Lord. I'm not going to ask you to physically stand. But if you say, I want to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life. I want him to forgive me of all my sin. I want him to, to save me. And I want heaven to be home someday on the other side of this life. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand and put it right back down. That's all you got to do. Yeah, hands are up everywhere. Can you just do this, whether you're at this location or another or in your living room? Let's all say this prayer together. Jesus, today I choose to make you the leader of my life. Today I choose to let you lead me, forgive me, and love me. I accept your unconditional love. Forgive me of all I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, I pray for us, all of us, that we would choose to be devoted, that we would choose to come expectant, that we would choose to allow you to change us, even the areas that we don't want change. And Lord, lastly, that we would be the rescue. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.